A Godric and Felix Story Charnel Congress Written by Joshua Reynolds Sylvania Its name stands on a map like a poxmark. It is a black boil that has been lanced again and again, yet never ceases to plague Sigmar's children, and it is one that I fear never will. I would journey into that sinister domain more than once at my taciturn companion's side though never without paying a higher toll in blood and hope than I would have liked. Oh, Ulrica! Sylvania, whose only export is death. Sylvania, whose serpent fang masters cluster in forgotten places like the great bats whose bones decorate the rude peasant shrines which line the black road. It was, and is, a dangerous place, even for a slayer and even more so for this all-too-human wordsmith. But, as to just how dangerous, we were sorely unaware. Luckily, or unluckily, we were soon to make the acquaintance of a tutor of some distinction. From My Travels with Godrek, Volume 2, by Herr Felix Jäger, Aldorf Press, 2505. The black water split as the pole came down. It pierced the murky depths and stirred up the dull mud below. Leaning hard against the pole, Andre Borges whistled tunelessly through stumps of rotting teeth as he forced his skiff through the water, a single torch lighting his way. The tune was half prayer and half body sonata, and had been passed down from father to son since as far back as Andre could recall, which, he had to admit, wasn't very far. He was not a thinker, Andre and he knew that. You couldn't be a thinker and survive in hell fen. Instinct and faith, those were the only tools that mattered. Well, those and a good strong axe. Eyes long since turned yellow from cheap rotgut scanned the trees which clustered on the legion of hummocks and bowls of strange black earth that seemed to float on the oily water. The torch, its flame caged in an iron hood with holes punched in to let out the light, made the ugly little island seem to dance. Andre shuddered. His grandfather had avowed as those buboes of dirt were graves, and that the fen was not but a bone garden flooded way back when. Andre could believe it, too. If there was one thing that the fen didn't lack, it was bones. White, yellow, and brown, hiding in the tangled roots of trees or beneath the mud. There were bones everywhere, of every shape and size. Anatomists and articulators from as far away as Aldorf paid a pretty penny for full skeletons in good condition. Carnival men paid even more for mismatched specimens, strung together with catgut and twine, that they could then pass off as mutants or demons, and maybe some of them even were. The dark between the trees hid many secrets after all, and there were bowers and runoffs that Andre would not have gone into for all the Carls in Stirland and for all the ale in Nordland. Helfen was home to more than just the dead, although they were by far the most visible inhabitants. Dead no see, spirits no hear, Andre murmured, pitching his thin shoulder against the pole. It was an old prayer, but a good one, especially this close to the black road. Keep the kings of bats and rats from smelling our fear, he continued, listening to the whispers of the fen. If your ears were trained to hear, it spoke volumes, this old swamp. The flap of a heron's wings or the splash of a snake sliding into the water told you where it was safe to go. The chittering of marsh rats spoke to the presence of the waterlogged dead, which stumbled mindlessly through the trees, still fighting a battle long over and the participants long turned into dust. The rats ate the dead as they wandered, riding them like a furry cloak squirming and heaving as they gnawed and fought over the putrid flesh. That was the story anyway, and he had seen enough to know that stories were close enough to the truth where the fan was concerned. Andre felt his gorge rise and turned his thoughts to other things, namely shiny things, or even rusty things, as long as they were old things. For generation upon generation, the Borges had ploughed the fen for the treasures of the ancient days, and not just them. The fenmen were as numerous as the townsmen, although less apt to congregate. 
The fen had been the site of so many battles, of so much death, that beneath its stagnant waters was wealth enough for a nation. The arms and armor of kings and lords and dwarven fanes and elven princes were there for the taking, if you knew where to look. Aye, and more besides that. When the blood counts had marched to war out of the mountains and forests, they had sunk towns and villages into the mire with dark magic. Andre's ancestors had been the survivors of one such great drowning, or so his grandmother said. In a way, if you looked at it right, it was only just that he plied the swamp for livelihood, since the swamp had taken so much in turn. He resumed his whistling, momentarily cheered. He bent his pole forwards, digging into the mud. The whistle died behind his lips as the skiff thumped to a halt. Mouth suddenly dry, he braced himself and probed the water with the pole. It was only a root or a rock, nothing more, he thought. But the water is skull deep, a small voice whispered in the back of his head. He jabbed down with the pole, hoping to dislodge or shift whatever he had run into. The swamp was silent. Andre began to tremble. He jabbed again, more forcefully. Something grabbed the skiff. He shrieked in disbelief as the hand came out of the water and fastened on the prow of the skiff with an ugly wet sound. Bloated, dripping meat hooked the wood. Fingers like rotting sausages tightened and the skiff dipped. Andre fell onto his rear and crab walked backwards, trying to get away as water sloped over the sides and filled the prow. No, 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 he babbled. A flash of orange split the water a moment later, and a strange gurgling sound filled the air. Fear gave Andre frenzied strength, and he jerked the pole loose from its captor and drove it down towards the strip of orange, even as it thrust upwards. The sound became words, and the pole was seized scant moments from impact by a ham-sized hand. A face out of nightmare rose out of the water, spitting curses. On a pox riddled grobby, the dwarf snarled, ripping the pole out of Andre's hands. A single eye blazed furiously at Andre out of a face that had seen the wrong end of too many fists, and the great orange crest of hair dipped and bobbed alarmingly over the sun browned expanse of a shorn skull. The dwarf spun the pole and gripped it like a spear, thrusting one end down at something he had seemingly straddled below the waterline. Die, you oversized hunk of awful! Die and be damned! The dwarf bellowed, his massive shoulders bunging and flexing, as he struck the unseen target again and again. Whatever it was, shifted beneath the water, and the dwarf toppled into the skiff, still beating at it with Andre's pole. The skiff's prow sank even lower, thanks to the dwarf's weight, and Andre screamed, fearing he'd be in the water with that thing in moments. But instead of sinking the skiff, the dwarf's opponents chose to follow him out of the dark embrace of the fen. Eyes like boiled eggs glared blankly out of a face that wasn't. The dead man's jaw chomped mindlessly as the zombie reached for its prey. Andre yelped. You want something to chew on, maggot belly? Have this, the dwarf growled, clambering to his feet and letting fly with the pole. The zombie skull exploded in a burst of black gore and stinking meat, as the dwarf's blow connected. The skiff bobbed back above the water as the twitching corpse slumped back into the swamp. The dwarf washed his sink and then turned to Andre. He was big, bigger than any of his kind the Fenman had seen before. A veritable ambulatory boulder, he was bare-chested and clad only in a pair of striped trousers and thick boots. A leather patch covered one eye, and a delicate chain connected one nostril to one earlobe. Vibrant blue tattoos covered the muscular frame and moved in odd ways as the dwarf breathed. Do you see the other one, Mandling? he rumbled, gripping the pole tight enough to cause the hard wood to creak. Andre could only gape. The dwarf grunted in apparent exasperation. Then his one good eye narrowed, and he raised the pole, as if to do to Andre what he'd done to the zombie. Andre shrieked and tried to dart away. The dwarf shoved him aside and brought the pole down on the second zombie as it pulled itself out onto the rear of the skiff. It fell forwards, revealing a large axe embedded in its back. There it is, 
the dwarf grunted. He tossed the much abused pole to Andre and stamped on the back of the zombie's neck. He grabbed the axe, wrenching it easily out of the squirming corpse's back, and then, almost casually, let fly with a backhanded swipe that sent the zombie's head splashing into the water. The dwarf kicked the headless body into the water to join his head, and then turned to Andre. Well, what are you waiting for, manling? Get out, he said. What? Andre said, clutching the pole tight to his chest. Are you deaf? I said, get out, the dwarf said, examining the edge of his axe. In the torchlight, it seemed to glow with an eerie fire. He ran a thumb across the blade and then popped it into his mouth. I need your skiff. I got more maggot men to return to their graves. Look to your left. Felix Yeager shouted, as he drove the edge of his sword through the neck of an ambulatory corpse. Damn it, Heinz! Left, I said! As the opponent fell, still clutching for him blindly, Felix splashed towards the other man as fast as he could. But it wasn't quick enough. Luckless Heinz gave an abortive shriek as the dead man he hadn't seen grabbed his head and gave it a brutal twist. Felix winced at the sound of bones popping and ligaments snapping. But then he was on the thing, with no more time for anything save violence. Felix chopped into a mossy skull, dropping the zombie like a rock. He yanked Karagul free and spun, just in time to see Heinz, his head still the wrong way around, stagger upright. Oh, Heinz, Felix said, as a chill caressed his spine. They had met the man in Wurtband, and he seemed a decent enough soul for a sellsword. Now he was anything but. Felix ducked under Heinz's groping arms and stabbed upwards. His sword cut through the corpse's chest and thrust upwards, burrowing towards the dead man's skull. Kicking Heinz's now quiescent body into the hip-deep water, Felix whispered a silent prayer to Moore for the man's soul. As the face of Heinz vanished beneath the water, he said, I guess you are right, Heinz. We should have never left Wurtbad. He looked around, blinking sweat out of his eyes. It felt like they had been fighting for hours, but he knew it had only been minutes. Minutes since they had brought their quarry to ground, only to find themselves caught in a trap. In retrospect, it should have been the obvious ploy. They'd been fools to think that a necromancer wouldn't know that they were on his trail and wouldn't prepare some obstacle for them. Said obstacle had been a number of zombies hidden beneath the dark waters of the fen to overturn and shatter their boats. Now they were all waist deep in the foul waters of the fen, fighting a seemingly innumerable horde of zombies. Hindsight makes seers out of us all, he grunted to himself as he waded towards the others. They had been twenty strong setting out of Wurtband. Now they were only ten. Well, nine. Gatrek was Sigmar knew where. The Slayer, already at a decided disadvantage in this water, which was shoulder deep for a dwarf, had been pulled underwater by three dead men, and had, as yet, not resurfaced. The thought left a bad taste in Felix's mouth. Not just because Gatrek's death would vastly increase the odds against them, but because he had sworn to witness said death. Despite everything, he had come to believe that the Slayer truly deserved the saga to celebrate his berserk death wish. Well, that, and he had no doubt whatsoever that the Slayer's shade would haunt him forever if he failed to deliver the saga. Gatrick had pulled him from beneath the hooves of the Emperor's elite cavalry, and Felix had sworn thereafter to chronicle the dwarf's heroic doom. Alcohol had been involved, of course, as it was in most things involving the Slayer. But Felix's sense of honor, battered as it was, held him to his newly chosen course. A scream of pain jerked him out of his reverie. Two zombies fell on a brawny mercenary named Hugh, their jagged teeth tearing into his flesh. He howled in agony as they dragged him beneath the water. A third fell on him and bit out his throat, reducing the number of the group to nine. As Felix passed them, he took the head off Hugh's killer. There was nothing else he could do for the man, and standing still for too long would only ensure that he would join him in death. Or undeath, as was the case for some of their companions. He thought of Heinz and felt sick. 
The clutching dead were as foul as anything he'd encountered in his travels with Godrek. Even worse than mutants. At least mutants were alive. Ugly, but alive. Nearby, Martin Holtz, a scar-faced priest of Sigmar, roared out prayers and imprecations as he swung his hammer, with almost mechanical precision. Near him, Stefan Russ, a Templar of the Order of Sigmar, fired one of his innumerable pistols that were holstered about his person, and potted a stumbling corpse before it could close with the bellowing holds. The two men were the nominal leaders of this possibly doomed expedition, and though Felix had little use for either the witch hunter or his priestly companion, he had to admit that both men were giving a good account of themselves. Maggot riddled fingers became tangled in the red Sudaland cloak, nearly jerking him off his feet. Felix nearly dropped his sword as the zombie hauled him backwards. He fumbled at a cloak's clasp as it constricted about his throat. A sword flashed and Felix stumbled forwards, off balance. The zombie, deal limbed now, turned slowly and groaning. The sword flashed again, dropping the creature to its knees. Eyes forward, Jaeger! The blade's wielder said. Pale-skinned and shock-headed, Andrzej Yuldvich, a Templar of Moor, was nearly as inhuman as the corpses they fought. Felix cuffed his fangs and swept Karagul out, bisecting a cadaverous thing with a cleft face. Yuldvich joined him and they turned in a circle, dispatching the moving corpses that saw to surround them. Where's Olaf? Felix said over the shoulder. A sizzling spurt of flame nearby gave him the answer. Olaf Nordheimer, bulky and bullet-headed beneath his vibrant crimson beard and wildly spiked hair, splashed forwards, gesturing with his staff. Burn, you maggoty beasts! Burn! The wizard bellowed. As zombies were reduced to staggering torches, he began to laugh wildly, his eyes glittering. A sash made of clattering bronze keys dangled from his torso, and the belt of the same swung about his waist. Strange tattoos covered his muscular arms and chest. He enjoys his work, Yulvich noted dispassionately, as a burning corpse toppled into the water in front of him. Maybe a bit too much, Felix muttered. The wizard had accompanied Holtz and Russ from Aldorf, though neither man seemed happy with his presence. Felix couldn't blame them. He had met several magic users in his day, and Olaf was by far the most disturbing. The wizards of the Bright College were, to a man, the most dangerous of their kind, as wild and unpredictable as the flames they wielded. But then again, none of their group was what a sane man would consider to be a comforting presence. A zealot priest, a witch hunter, a servant of the death god, a mad wizard, and of course, Godrek. A strange crew indeed. And their quarry was even worse. Ernst Stillman was by all accounts a third-rate necromancer, whose only claim to previous fame was being arrested for making dead rats dance in a restaurant. Now he was accused of stealing a reliquary of great importance, from the Garden of Saints beneath the Grand Temple of Sigmar in Aldorf, and of murdering a number of priests and Templars in the process. The greatest heroes of the Empire were interred in the Garden of Saints, including past emperors, high-ranking members of the Colleges of Magic, and notable members of several Templar orders. So Felix could only imagine what Stillman had stolen. The skull of maybe one of the Patriarchs of Magic, or the preserved finger of a Grand Theogonist, maybe. It could be anything. Neither Holtz nor Russ were saying, though Felix had tried his best to worm the answer out of them on the road from Wurtbad. Besides the reliquary, Stillman had also kidnapped the daughter of a semi-friendly publican that had been keeping Godric in ale during their stay in Wurtbad. The man was a companion from Godric's old days as a mercenary, or so he said. That was enough motivation for Godric to bully himself and Felix a berth in the hunting party. Thinking of the girl elicited a stab of guilt. Elsa. Felix had hoped she'd share his bed, but Stillman had put pay to that. Abruptly, a rusty blade looped towards his head, and he was forced to defend himself. He pushed all thoughts of the girl aside. Despite Olaf's magic, their attacker's numbers didn't seem to be diminished. Their quarry had all the dead of Helfen at his disposal, 
and apparently he wasn't shy about it. Something that once upon a time might have been an elf lurched at him from the side, moving with a crooked kind of grace. Flesh crawling, Felix parried the too swift blow it launched at him and tried to remove its head. The zombie jerked back, blind eyes rolling in its skull. Its thin, needle-like sword darted for him, piercing his guard and tracing a line of fire across his arm. Even in death, it was faster than a human. Cursing, Felix stumbled and fell on his rear in the foul water. The elf thing loomed above him, raising his sword. Desperate, Felix shoved his weapon up and the zombie impaled itself on the point. With a grunt, Felix tossed the twitching body over his head and accepted a hand from a gaunt Sturlander named Horst. We're going to die here, Horst said, seemingly neither pleased nor displeased by the fact. Possibly, Felix said, jerking past him to spit a zombie that had been creeping up behind the man. Kicking the corpse off the blade, he continued. But I don't intend to make it easy for them. We may not have a choice. Horst's equally dour cousin, Schultz, moaned, braining a long dead orc. They'll overwhelm us if we don't, he began. But whatever he'd been about to say died with him as an axe older than Felix himself chopped down into his head. Schultz sank to his knees, tongue protruding, eyes bulging as the dripping zombie pulled the weapon free. Horse shrieked and made to stab his cousin's killer, but two more dead things grabbed him by the arms and pulled him in half. Felix blinked in horror as blood spattered his face, and then he scrambled back as more cadavers came out of the water. He backed away, the sword extended and his heart sinking. More corpses stepped out from between the trees, or rose out of the water. Schultz had been right. Holtz and Russ fell back, Yuldvich trailing them. Olaf joined Felix, face split in a wild grin. Down to us, lads, he barked, ghostly flames coruscating about his hook fingers. Don't sound so happy about it, Felix said. Sigmar stands with us, Holt snapped, getting a better grip on his two-handed hammer. And more guides our hands, Yulvich said mildly. Holt and Russ glared at him. The latter pulled two pistols from beneath his ragged cloak and cocked them. Felix read it Karagul, held slippery in his hands. He swallowed, trying not to gag on the stink of death surrounding them. He hadn't planned on dying this way. I hadn't planned on dying at all, he thought desperately. Ah, bugger all the gods, Olaf yelled, throwing his hands out. The water boiled and the zombies that waited in it began to cook. The wizard gesticulated and spat painful syllables and the heat grew blisteringly intense, causing the water to turn into a stinking mist and the nearby trees to curl up like dead bugs. Despite the heat, however, the dead kept coming. They had neither fear nor physical sensation to exploit. The rotting flesh slawed off their bones, cooked into a stinking stew. Olaf cursed virulently as skeletal hands groped towards him grabbing for his spiked beard and robes. He fell back, his bravado melting into panic as he flailed backwards. Felix and the others stepped forwards to join him, stabbing and shooting. Fingers that looked like burst sausages clutched at Felix's wrist and blade, and the flesh of his hands turned red as he stamped and cut and shoved. Felix's arms and shoulders began to cramp from exhaustion and heat, and his hands and face stung with the burns. A steaming skull thrust towards him, blackened jaws gaping. He cried out and made to swat it away, until he realized that it wasn't attached to anything. Instead, it hurtled past him, struck a tree and fell into the water with a hiss. One moment later, he realized he could hear a familiar voice bellowing in precautions in Kozalid, the tongue of the dwarves. A shattered ribcage and a snapped femur fell into the water as the steam began to dissipate. Are you trying to kill them all yourselves, manlings? Gotrek Gurnison said. Gotrek was perched like a gargoyle on top of a prow of a skiff. Relief flooded Felix. Zombie parts flowed around him, some still twitching, and the slayer's muscular form was covered in spoiled blood and rotting meat. Where did you find the skiff? Felix said, looking up at the slayer. 
The slayer motioned absently at a swamp. Out there somewhere, he said. It was obvious that he had cut his way through the rear of the horde as Olaf's wall of steam consumed them from the other side, although he wasn't even breathing hard. Godric looked around. You didn't leave much to me, manling, he grumbled, fixing Felix with a single glittering eye. Well, you weren't around, so we had to make do, Felix said, laughing shakily. Godric sniffed. No fault of mine, my axe was stuck. He looked around at the others. Looks like enough of you survived at any rate, he said dismissively. No thanks to you, Russ snapped. The witch hunter was a lean man with hangdog features and hard eyes. He was busy reloading his pistols. Felix got the feeling that the man would have been happier with a good death than he was with Godric's rescue. Godric fixed the man with his one good eye. Am I expected to fight your battles for you then, burner of women? He said. Felix swallowed, recognizing the tone in Godric's voice. The slayer was still worked up and killing mad. The zombies didn't dull his frenzy as much as strengthened it. He could explode into more violence at any time. I burn heretics, slayer. Russ spat. Be they men or women, human or otherwise. Godric flushed and bared crooked teeth in a snarl. His axe trembled in anticipation. An argument serves no purpose now, Felix said quickly, moving between them. Stillman is still out there and likely planning to send more of his legions after us. Maybe we should get out while the going is good. Even as he said it, a twist of guilt speared into him although he knew the likelihood of Godric agreeing with him was none. He didn't like the thought of leaving Elsa to the necromancer's attention, good reason or not. We could go back to Vurdbad. We could rouse the militia, he said half-heartedly. Run away? Flee from maggot men and nearsighted whelps of necromancers? Godric snorted. Felix forced himself not to smile in relief. My axe is thirsty for more substantial fare, manling, and I will not deny it. Ay, and Sigmar demands justice, Holt said. The necromancer's desecration of sacred ground must not stand. Russ nodded, obviously in full agreement. Stillman has been for the pyre for a long time now, the witch hunter added. Not to mention the fate of the girl. Yuldvich said, sheaving his blade. The guilt in Felix's gut grew heavier. He glanced at the trees and immediately wished he hadn't. Godrek, he hissed, his fingers tightening around the sword hilt. I, I see them, man Leng, Godrek said. We all see them, Russ muttered, his fingertips dancing nervously across the butts of the pistols, hanging across the narrow chest in their waterproof holsters. Sigmar preserve us. He does, Holt said. He had his eyes closed as if in prayer. Clumsy shapes splashed through the trees. More zombies, Felix realized with a chill. Just how many dead men does this cesspit possess, he said. Thousands, Holt said, opening his eyes. His scarred face twisted into an expression of distaste. More even than fell in the Battle of Hell Fen. They say every river in Sylvania carries corpses to the Fen. He patted a hammer that lay across his shoulder. It is a cursed place. One day we will burn it off the map. Olaf laughed. Count me in, Scarface. Let's start today. He gestured and a spurt of flame crashed into the trees. Rank upon rank of zombies, both human and otherwise, were illuminated by Olaf's conjured flames. Had they been watching them all this time, Felix wondered. Several of the creatures began to stumble forwards and Godric snarled. He tightened his grip on the axe and plunged off the skiff and into the water to meet the lurching dead. They closed in about him and the slayer disappeared out of view. Felix started forwards. What are you doing? 
Russ said, grabbing his arm. Godric needs help, Felix said, shaking the arm loose of the witch hunter's grip. There was a roar and then several rotting bodies skidded across the water like skipping stones. No, Godric grunted. No, I don't. The slayer floundered through the water, dripping and sullen. These dead things are not a challenge, he growled, fiddling with his crest, which drooped alarmingly thanks to his plunge in the water. Well, is that it? he roared out, shaking the axe at the swamp. Silence greeted the slayer's demand. But then, in the darkness, someone laughed.